Well, good morning and welcome to uh, what we're hoping is going to be the last Sunday when we're not allowed physically in our buildings at all. Uh, we're hoping that these uh, online services will continue in some form because not everybody's going to be able to get back to church. Um, but, uh, but we are hopeful that some people at least will be able to gather together next week and more details on that will follow when we know more what it might look like. Um, but uh, today uh, I want to help us to think about as we enter this next stage of um, the coronavirus and, and responding to it, um, uh, how do we think Christianly about that? Um, in many ways it's a harder stage of the virus. When we locked down there was that real sense of all being in it together um, you know, there were sacrifices to be made, but we all had to do the same thing to stay at home, and there was much less uh, debate and division about what was the right thing to do. Now, on the other hand, um, we're moving into a, into a more challenging stage of the virus. And so it's important that we think about what would, as Christians, how, how should we live? How should we approach this? What should our priorities be? And so we need to find a voice that can speak Christianly into this with authority. Um, we've been, I don't know if you've been following um, the Black Lives Matters protest, but it, it's fascinating to me how in order for someone to be able to speak into that issue, they very often have to emphasise their credentials. I was listening to a, pro, a programme on Radio 4 um, where the lady, who was very good and was making some very good points, but kept having to um, almost justify herself by reminding the listeners that she was a black head teacher from London and it was as if um, that if she hadn't have had those credentials she wouldn't have been um, valid, that, that her voice wouldn't have been um, one that was heard by anyone else in the debate. And that's, uh, there is something in that actually if you think about it with relation to the coronavirus as well. If, if, if someone who is not at risk at the virus, at, di at dying from the virus, is, is pushing to reopen society, well, we can say, well, it's all very well. Of course, that's what you think, because you're not really at risk. But it's a very different story if someone is pushing to reopen society who stands to, you know, who is in a very high-risk category themselves. We perhaps listen harder and more carefully to what they have to say. Well, as I say, we're moving to this new phase of the virus. And I think if lockdown, um, as it arrived, perhaps brought a stronger sense of community, as we go out of that, I think it threatens to undo all that coming togetherness that we had, to undo, undo all that hard work, and instead to drive us further apart. And so what we need as Christians uh, when we think about who we are to listen to, is someone who is speaking from the position of being shut away, of being locked away whilst everybody else enjoys their freedom. And amazingly, that is what we have in the Bible. So some of the books of the Bible are called the prison letters because they're written by the Apostle Paul from prison. He was writing to Christians who still had their freedom whilst he himself had been imprisoned for speaking about Christ. And so I want to read to you a bit from Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, written from prison, in which I think, uh, and a section that I think is going to help us as we think about how we should be as we enter this new phase of lockdown. And this is from Ephesians 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Do you see what Paul does at the start there? He emphasises his credentials as a prisoner in the Lord, he says. In other words, 
I'm telling you to live this kind of life from a place where, not where everything is going super well for me, I'm telling you to live from a place of restriction and frustration and limitation myself. And as Paul, I'm sure, would have been able to tell us, our natural instincts when we're limited by society or when we're trapped and frustrated is to lash out at others, to get angry or resentful. But Paul, who clearly understands these instincts, says, no, actually, as Christians, there is another way, a Jesus way, a better way. Live a life, he says, worthy of your calling as followers of Christ. And what does that look like? Well, the language he uses, I think, is incredible. It's beautiful. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bear with each other in love. And I find those words so challenging. My natural tendency is to live life seeking adventure, a little bit on the edge, acting with swift conviction. And I find it hard to be patient and gentle with those who want to take things a bit slower, who take a more cautious approach. I find it hard to be humble, to remember that my way is not always best or right or the most logical. I find it hard to bear with those who experience different weaknesses from my own or who have different character traits. And I know that the reverse can be true as well. Others will find me reckless and impatient and impulsive. They'll find it hard to believe as well that they may not always be right about the appropriate pace at which to approach things. They will find it hard to bear with me or others who take a different approach from them. And in Christ, the call to both myself and to others is to put aside our natural impatience and frustration and pride and to refuse to channel the difficulties of lockdown into anger and frustration and resentment at each other, at those coming down on holiday and filling the beaches, or at those who seem to be trying to keep us locked down for as long as possible until all risk of any kind has vanished. Whichever end of that spectrum you fall on, the call in Christ Jesus is to put those feelings to one side. And instead, let's be patient with each other. Let's allow each other to go at different speeds and respect the approaches that we each take. Let's be gentle Let's not argue or provoke each other. And above all, let's bear with each other in love. This is a practical call. It means to walk alongside each other, trying to understand thing from the things from the other person's point of view. It means putting yourself in the position of the person who has had to shield for the last three months and who is now terrified that all their sacrifices are for nothing as the virus spikes again. It means putting yourself in the position of the small business owner who is facing the destruction of the life they have worked so hard to build over the last 20 years. It means putting yourself in the position of those who are left unemployed and facing bleak prospects of more work any time soon. It means putting yourself in the position of those who have lo lost loved ones, either to the virus, or who have lost them and been unable to mourn and uh, say farewell to them appropriately in this difficult time. And as we hold these people, as we hold each other in our minds and hearts, putting ourselves in each other's position, it does become all the easier to bear with each other in love, to act not just for our own interests, or using our own logic, or based on our own characters, but acting for the interests of others who are not like us as well. 
And why do we do this? Well, we do it, says Paul, to keep hold of the hard-won unity and friendship that we have in Jesus Christ. To refuse to allow our circumstances to divide and fragment us. Ultimately, these things that we get frustrated and angst-ridden about, they will pass. It is only our faith in Christ that will endure. As Paul says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let's hold on to each other as we unite around this truth. And over the weeks and months ahead, let's refuse to be divided by the things that threaten to undermine our unity. Instead, let's be humble. Let's be gentle. Let's be patient with each other. And let's bear with each other in love. In his name, we pray these things for one another. Amen.